My name is Dr. Tamsin Willie Barker, and I'm an evolutionary biologist. And I'm also a biomimic. That's someone who looks at other species to find solutions that uh, have stood the test of time and try to emulate them to solve our own challenges. Much of what I do today is uh, working with companies, and I, I help them find revolutionary new solutions to their own challenges. Uh, and all of them are inspired by ancient adaptations uh, that have been honed over billions of years. You love nature when you're a kid. When, as you get older and more serious in your corporate job, you know, you, you kind of tend to get separated from it and, uh, and forget it's there for you. And so a lot of what I do and other biomimics do is, is working to get people reconnected um, back to places like this where they can look at these ancient species for inspiration. What better place uh, to be inspired by nature than right out here in Anza Borrego. Uh, so welcome to my journey and let's go have fun. You can see this landscape right here is so primeval. You know, you could you can imagine um, dinosaurs roaming in a land like this. I think of these huge companies as dinosaurs. And you know, the dinosaurs got really, really big, right? Really big. But they needed huge bones to support all that weight. And that is the same thing that we have in our companies today. But at the same time those dinosaurs were roaming the land, the ants and termites were as well, working alongside them. All these species alive today, all of them are survivors that uh, passed the test of time, and they've honed strategies that work. When you're a little kid, right, you know, you play with blocks, and oh, hey, let's see who can build a higher tower. So what do you do? You know, you put one on top of the other, one on top of the other, and you get pretty high, and you get up there, and then pretty soon, you know, it wobbles and it all falls down. As well, if I build the base a little wider, I can go a little bit taller. Because no matter how wide you make the base, you're always going to be limited to some degree in how high you can get. It's, it's child's play, right? Uh, but why do we insist on structuring our organizations this way? If you have one manager for every 10 employees, and that manager makes three times the amount of a base employee, um, then pretty soon, you know, you do the math and you realize that these managers, this skeletal structure that prevents the organization from collapsing, is a quarter of your payroll. So as you grow bigger, that is going to eat more and more of your costs. The higher up the structure you go, the more report lines converge. And so you get one person or a few people at the very top uh, being forced to make all these decisions when really they don't have the information to do it. They're overwhelmed with meetings and the company still fails to adapt. And how can one person up at the top uh, know everything they need to know um, about what's going on on the front lines. So how do you get that intelligence um, on the ground to the people need, that need it? There are many species that have formed collaborative societies and they're not working in these vertical hierarchies. They're working in these flat networks with uh, collective intelligence. Every time the, the size of a city doubles, uh, it goes up in productivity per capita, 15%. That's, you know, so it's getting more and more innovative and productive the more it grows. But if you look at a company, uh, it goes down in productivity the bigger it gets. So it's losing efficiency. So what's going on? Why can't we design um, a company to be more like a city? The city is really an organic living thing, and that's the difference here. Living things grow, they change, they perceive their environment, they adapt, and machines uh, are designed to do just one thing and every time the conditions change you have to redesign that machine which is why the executives are constantly restructuring and moving things around and they're always a little behind the curve um, because it's not a living thing. It, it's not the strongest of the species that survive uh, nor the most intelligent but it's the one most responsive to change and Charles Darwin said that um, you know in 1859 and it's still true today. And I think we're going to find that the most successful companies of the future and of the present are, are companies that begin to uh, respond to like a living thing, um, to change their management structure to become living things, rather than trying to design them uh, like machines that we've been doing for so long. Why do we keep uh, designing these companies this way if it's so obviously flawed? Um, you know, and the answer is that these are a complex adaptive system. They want to stay where they are. They resist any kind of change.
These social insects are some of the most successful species on the entire planet. If you took all the ant species alive today and weighed them, they would weigh about the same as all of us humans put together. Um, so roughly equivalent. The termites are 27 times more termites uh, than there are ants or people. We're everywhere and, and so are they. So these really are some of the most ancient and successful um, cooperative societies that we have on Earth today. The way the superorganisms do it is every individual uh, makes their own choices based on the experience that they have. The ants have been doing that for 150 million years and the termites for a quarter of a billion years. Um, these are collaborative societies that act as if they were one individual. But they're composed of many individuals, genetically distinct, and much like our own societies and our own companies. The different about uh, them is that every individual has a different job. They all take on different tasks, and they um, none of them can survive alone uh, for very long. Really, whenever you find a species where it takes a village to survive, that's that's probably a superorganism. And, um, and there's a lot of biologists, including E.O. Wilson, believe that humans are superorganisms as well, and I would agree with them. That humans are superorganisms, but we haven't been doing it for very long. We haven't been doing it long at all. Maybe a hundred thousand years, maybe a million years, but that's nothing compared to these other superorganisms that have been doing it for 150 million years, 250 million years, um, and even if you want to extend that family to the uh, fungus underground, half a billion years. If you look at the ants and the termites, they're really doing a lot of the same kinds of things that we do. Um, the ants are herding aphids and caterpillars, much like we herd and milk uh, goats and cows. And the uh, leafcutter ants and the termites are actually farming. Living things self-organize. They build from the bottom up. And, um, you know, if you think about the June bug, you know, he flies around and he bangs into things and it looks really chaotic and messy. Um, and you wonder, you know, how could such a stupid creature survive? But the reason he flies that way is because he doesn't know where his target is. He doesn't know where the female June bug is. So when he's flying, he's evaluating how many molecules of her scent are in this patch versus that patch. And he just goes towards the one um, that seems best to him at that time. And so he zigs and zags all over the place and it looks crazy, um, but it works. And that's really the difference between a living thing and a machine. It seems very inefficient, um, but when you have billions of years of evolution, the results are very complex and, and actually very well honed to their circumstances and also resilient. Um, because they have stood the test of time and they have to work no matter what. We don't want to design things that way because it is inefficient and it does seem blundery and slow. But when you look at a superorganism, they have tens of millions in some cases, individuals that are, that are self-organizing in this way. And those patterns build. My favorite of these organisms are these uh, mycorrhizal fungi. And these are um, individual uh, fungus, um, each one, in the, in the spring, each year, they begin to grow and they turn into these long hyphae. And what they're doing is they're going out searching for other individuals um, to fuse with because they need so many to form these dense networks. And everywhere you go underground, almost everywhere on Earth, uh, these beings are perceiving your footfalls and they are sensing and responding in real time um, any kind of changing conditions. Is they're looking for tiny molecules of water or nutrients and they're shuttling them around these dense networks um, and actually feeding the trees um, and themselves in these landscapes. So they really they, be, they form the foundation of uh, the diverse ecosystems that we see around. And the amazing thing is when you look at their networks they look so much like our own and you can really see that we are actually converging on something um, very much like their own society. There's a lot we can learn from what they do because they've been doing it for so long. What you want is a superorganism. And the great news is you already have one at your fingertips. There are superorganisms all over your organization. I'll give you one of my favorite examples of collective intelligence, and that's the slime mold. 
Well, not much to look at, a blob of gooey cytoplasm um, is the inspiration for the blob. Uh, but it is filled with distinct, genetically distinct individuals, um, all making their own choices. It emerges into this collective intelligence that looks very much like our top-down, purposeful, um, targeted activities, um, but with a lot less uh, computing power and a lot less expense. These um, individuals are going to the soil. They're just searching for food, you know, they're just blobbing around looking for food. Um, but when food gets scarce, what they do is they put out this alarm signal and then all the other amoeba come running, slimy, um, over and they fuse together to join this slime mold, this, this slug. And the slug has powers that uh, individually they never had. So now this thing can climb through soil much, much more effectively and it can go over leaves, you know, it can, it can really travel. So they look for a nice warm place with the right kind of conditions they like. They, they make this little stalk and they shoot the spores of the next generation um, into the air to go off and start the next um, bunch of slime molds. And if you take uh, flecks of oats, just little oats, and you put them on a map, um, on little cities on a map um, or destinations, and you set the blob loose, what it'll do is it'll fan out um, all the individuals search separately and then as they find these bits of food, the entire slime mold begins to coalesce into the most efficient route. And uh, it turns out those routes are more efficient than our own subway systems um, and train lines and roads. Any one individual isn't much to look at. A slime mold has no brain, uh, just a jelly-like blob. And a fungus is just you know one little cell there. Uh, and they're resilient. These networks, there's always another way to go around a problem. Um, and that is, uh, these are all things that we, we would like to see in our own companies. And they, they've already mastered it. They've been doing it for half a billion years. Um, and how do they do that? Well, the answer is collective intelligence. Instead of trying to concentrate decision-making um, in one executive center or one CEO, um, you distribute it among everyone. And you leverage everyone's diverse opinions and perspectives and what they know locally on the ground. Um, and you pull that and you see what emerges. There's a few deep patterns that I've observed that all of them really use and most of them revolve around this collective intelligence um, where they're pulling distributed local information to, uh, to get something much bigger. The reason this diversity and independence is so important is that if everyone's making guesses and you have enough people um, and they're diverse and independent, all those errors cancel out and you converge on something that is very close to accurate and true. So when a honeybee hive is successful, at some point it has to split up into daughter hives and, and some of the hive has to find some place new to live. And it's a life and death decision for them, so they take it very seriously. Most of the hive will go and gather on a branch and just wait quietly. But the old grannies, that because it's they, that's what they are, they're females. The oldest grannies, um, who are, have the most experience, will go out in this starburst pattern, looking all over um, for a suitable home. And when one of them finds something she likes, she'll, she'll circle it, uh, measure it. She looks, is it safe? Is it dry? Um, can it store enough honey for the winter? All these things. And she might take 40 minutes uh, looking at this. And then she'll return to the hive and she'll do a little waggle dance. She does a little dance that's actually symbolic, um, a lot like our own words or language. Um, and she'll tell the other bees exactly what direction it is and how far it is. Uh, and the more she likes it, the more of these dances she'll do. So other bee scouts see the dance and they'll follow her. Um, and then they, if they're convinced by her dance, they'll go out and evaluate the site as well. Uh, and they do the exact same thing. And then they'll come back to the hive and they'll do the dance as well. So you can see that dances for good sites start to amplify. They start to increase and build. Whereas uh, dances for less, you know, for lackluster sites start to fade away. It's, a, it's really a competition um, between these, these different sites. And eventually, um, one of the sites will reach some critical tipping point uh, threshold. And then all the bees um, come together and uh, move en masse to the new site. It turns out they almost always pick the best site. 
Um, so it, it looks chaotic, it looks messy. Um, it's hard to believe that they can come up with the right answer with this simple technique, but it, it actually works and they do choose um, the right site. The first thing these societies do is self-organize. Um, they use many diverse independent individuals and they connect them into a network. And when you connect, uh, action is no longer isolated within single individuals within, with their you know, limited perspective. When you connect them uh, and you have transactions between individuals, exchanges of information and resources, um, new things emerge, this network emerges, and that's when we get really uh, these, um, these complex outcomes. Uh, that we'd like to see in our companies. Individuals retain their diversity and independence and autonomy uh, to go where they want to go and make the choices they need to make and do it independently. Uh, but when we come together exchanging information and sharing goals and resources, um, that uh, those outcomes transcend those individual borders. So you can see how important diversity and independence are to the honeybees. They aggregate all this information into uh, one communication arena. Um, in this case, it's this waggle dance floor, but with ants, um, you know, when they find food, they put down a little trail of pheromone and other ants can follow that uh, to find the food source. So I see your dance, I'm gonna fly out, visit that. Um, I like it, I come back, I do a dance. It's very simple. Um, but they build and they aggregate um, until they hit some critical point uh, and then all the bees fly. So we see um, a real push to find all these algorithms that work, uh, that ants work with, and see if we can apply them to our own companies. Um, FedEx uh, uses a simple rule from ants, um, they don't make left turns, which just uh, increases the efficiency of their delivery routes. Uh, Southwest Airlines is using ant algorithms to load their planes more effectively. The uh, mycelial fungus uh, London's been using those models to reroute traffic snarls when they have accidents. So all kinds of algorithms, simple rules that we can take from from these super organisms for uh, to enhance our own collaboration. The sun is starting to set and it's cooling off. It's the perfect time for a little hike, see what we can find. And I hope you've enjoyed your visit to this beautiful place and maybe got a little inspiration. If you liked what you uh, heard, um, I have a new book out in March. You can pre-order it from Amazon anytime. And it's called Teeming, T-E-E-M-I-N-G, like the ants, Teeming. How super organisms work together to build infinite wealth on a finite planet. And we'll talk about collective intelligence and regenerative value, swarm creativity, uh, and the 2% difference between apes and, and humans. So I hope you've enjoyed this. Thank you so much and enjoy. Bye. Please feel free to send me your questions and comments on Twitter. Um, my handle is at bioinspired inc. That's at bioinspired underline inc. And, uh, and visit my website. It's drtamson.com. And you can sign up to get your free copy of uh, the Mycelial Way, which is a, a quick guide to superorganism living. Um, and I hope to see you there. Thanks.